on ways that games with learning outcomes can be leveraged by university instructors to enhance student engagement and develop intrinsic rewards for learning progression. In the last months, we pivoted all our events to focus specifically on how serious play can be a remarkably effective teaching strategy for an online learning environment. It may surprise you that events focusing on digital learning environments are sponsored by the rare and special collections units, the raw configuration of units from, for which I am responsible. But as we hope you'll agree when you join us for this and other play on series events, it may be a surprising pairing, but it's also a remarkably fruitful and exciting one that reminds us primary resources can make for moments of wonder in virtual as well as in physical form. Now to our presenters. Our first presenter is Megan Lotz, art librarian at Rutgers, where she teaches research workshops, builds collections, facilitates programming and events, and closely engages with students and faculty researching in the arts. We met Megan last summer when we discovered her work integrating analog games and primary resources into the university classroom. Pizza and Lego had never made so much sense together before. Megan is known for her work implementing Lego play and culture of creativity at the Rutgers Art Library and her work curating the Rutgers Art Library exhibition spaces. This coming term, she turns to teaching online and her presentation will focus on game-based and creative strategies that she will bring to the task. We're going to hear more about it now. Welcome, Megan. Hi, everyone. I'm just getting this set up. Let's see. Okay. All right. Can everyone hear me all right? And let me see before I had my chat box up, and I'd like to see that again. Oh, nope. Sorry, folks, almost there. And there we are. Okay, wonderful. So I'll assume everyone hears me. We're all good, it looks like, and fantastic. Like many of you, I was introduced to play not long after leaving my mother's womb. Think about how many games you've played with a baby just to get them to smile, desperate to communicate with a being incapable of a language or a language we know. We use primal sounds, noises, and sometimes comical gestures to engage and connect. As babies and small children, we negotiate much of our young lives through playful learning. But along the journey to adulthood, the fun stops. We begin to mature, and we're expected to take life seriously, and often play is the first aspect we remove from our everyday lives. For me, play has always been an important aspect of my life, but as I grow older, how I play has changed, and even more so in pandemic times. Thanks for coming today. And thanks to the rare and special collections, Osler Art and Archives, ROAR at McGill Library for hosting this event. My name is Megan Lutz. I'm faculty based out of the Rutgers University Libraries, New Brunswick. And my role on campus is as the art librarian, but like most librarians I know, I wear many hats. My research interests include outreach, engagement, creativity, play, and the work of library liaisons. Although I've been playing most of my life, it wasn't until 2014 when I attended the I2C2 Innovation and Creativity Conference in Manchester, UK, when I was introduced to LEGO series play, that I really began to think about play in libraries as a scholarly pursuit. Above, you'll see some of my favorite ways to play, including travel, swimming, hiking, walking my dogs, Woodrow and Logan. I like to go to shows and see live music. I like to take advantage of cheesy photo opportunities and so much more. Above, you can read the abstract from this presentation and note I've also placed these slides on SlideShare and please contact me if you have any issues accessing. I'd like to start off today with the show of hands of who likes to play. Please raise your hands high. Did anyone raise your hands? Okay, this activity isn't really ideal. We can't see each other. How about instead, Everyone, please type in the chat box an example of a play activity you enjoy. And please 
share more than one. So at this time, if you'll please enter into the chat box, like I suggested earlier, any play activities that you enjoy. And let's see if we're getting anything fun. I've got multiple screens. Ah, oh, of course, tennis is fabulous. One of my favorites. Escape rooms, absolutely. Anything else? Obviously, the options for this are endless. So one of the biggest problems with play is that it's hard to define. You know it when you see it or feel it. You can make a list of emotions that occur when playing, yet that does not define it. The Oxford English Dictionary defines play as both a noun and a verb. And as you can read in this slide, and for me personally, I think of play as a verb, an ephemeral experience. And for me, it's a mantra. It's a way of life. Play can take place in a singular or community environment, and it can be quiet or loud, and it's an activity in which one learns by doing. Play is contagious and a medium that exercises creativity and problem-solving skills, which are needed when creating scholarly research or working on innovative projects. So it's natural that libraries are considered places of play. However, there is one for unfortunate aspect about play, and that can be anxiety. Dr. Stuart Brown, the founder of the National Institute for Play, says one of the biggest issues for adults when engaging in play is the worry of looking silly, undignified, or dumb. It's really important to give ourselves permission to play, to find courage to play, and to embrace a playful mindset. One must be present, leap into play, and be prepared to make mistakes. Part of the problem with being adults when it comes to work and play, we're discouraged from making mistakes. But failure is part of one's journey. It's how we learn. But we must recognize just because we want to play doesn't mean we're always comfortable playing or that we have the ability to play. But what is key when it comes to play for any person or organization is being able to make time to play and to make play a priority. One of the aspects I appreciate most about the seminar I teach on play is when students leave my course, they're with eyes wide open. They can become transformed once they understand the importance of play and they're really rocked once they figure out how to apply this into their own lives. Playing to Learn in Higher Education is a 10-week course I teach for the Rutgers School of Art and Sciences and meets in the art library for 80 minutes each week. The course is an introduction to what is play and includes a visit to special collections and university archives, a Lego workshop, creating a game using a 14-inch pizza box, reading, watching videos, writing group discussions, keeping a play journal, and so much more. I've run the course two semesters now, and students rave about how much they learned by playing and how they wished all their courses were this engaging. In the images above, you can see a pizza box game housed in Rutgers Special Collections and University Archives, as well as two photos of students in the games that they've created out of these pizza boxes. Halfway through the course, students visit Special Collections and University Archives, where processing archivist Tara Maharjan leads a presentation highlighting unique games found in newspapers, books, from exhibits, and more. But perhaps most important, the students view College the Game Rutgers Edition, a game created in 1989 by Dark Horse Games, which uses a pizza box as the case and game board. For the final assignment of this course, each student is given a 14-inch pizza box and asked to create a game. The games are displayed in the art library on the final day of class, including a reception, guest critiques, and a pizza party. And because this assignment is left open for interpretation, and as one can imagine, students go above and beyond the expectations, they create dynamic games which include extensive instructions, one-of-a-kind hand-drawn artworks, and they all include a 14-inch pizza box. But folks, then the COVID-19 pandemic swept the world in the spring of 2020, and there was no opportunity for game presentations, the reception, no guest critiques, no pizza party. I mean, we missed the best part eating pizza and playing games. My heart was broken. However, here we are in July of 2020 and the pandemic is still around us. Therefore, I'm currently preparing this course for 100% virtual online experience for fall. I have to say, I don't know where anyone else is, but who I am and how I work has changed since the pandemic began. I've had to rethink all the ways in which I engage with students, faculty, staff, my colleagues, the public, my significant other, and more. And I think that one of the things which is key when planning for fall 2020 virtual courses is keeping in mind what kind of access your students will have to materials, printers, internet, et cetera. 
Accessibility is not equal and all students are not comfortable communicating issues that might be difficult to discuss. Also keeping accessibility in the forefront when you're creating educational resources, presentations, making games, et cetera. Think about what fonts you're using. Are your videos closed captioned? Do you have descriptions on your digital images? Also keep in mind empathy and inclusion. I've been doing my best to be extra patient with students, faculty, and patrons, even when I can't always relate. I'm regularly reminded that the candy and Kleenexes I keep in my office are not always virtually available, and that I must carefully listen to the patrons' needs. But also, I'm thinking about my learning goals. And if you're teaching asynchronous, how will you engage your students? How will they engage each other? And this isn't always this easy task in a virtual setting. First, it's good to start a session out slow. Start with something fun, a game, a story, a quip. Engage your audience, warm folks up, give latecomers a few minutes to sign on. There's a good chance you might be looking at something similar to the slide above. And remember that learning in a virtual environment is new to many of us. Think about something as simple as how will your students share the air? There's nothing worse than when a synchronous session turns into one or two participants answering all the questions or lecturing the class. When I'm running a synchronous one-shot bibliographic session or giving a presentation, I often ask participants to input responses into the chat box. Or maybe I throw out a poll or a survey for participants to answer. I stop for short activities, like please spend the next 30 seconds writing a six word definition of play. And although we won't take the time for this activity today, I have created a six word definition of play, and I encourage you all to think about this and try this yourself. My definition is playing, learning, laughing, and building community. So let's talk about some additional warm, warm up activities such as the ones lifted, listed above. And I won't read them off, but for those of you who are interested and are David Sedaris fans, the last prompt on this slide is one from one of the first courses he taught at the Arts Institute in Chicago. But beyond these activities, I question what else do individuals here do today to warm up your virtual classroom or to warm up your classroom? And I'd like you all to please put your answers in the chat. Tell me about ideas that you have. And I'm having trouble seeing my chat. So I'm just going to assume that you're all putting answers in there. And one of the things that I do want you to think about is when possible, get to know your audience. Think about who you'll be working with and try to learn a bit about their needs, wants, and expectations, if possible, before you begin engaging. Above, I have an outline of what each week's 80 minutes looks like, but I do want to written, no, this is not written in stone. I always plan for less because I want to make sure all the activities that I have planned are completed. There's nothing worse than having to quit a game or stop an activity before it's ended, but also make sure you take time for debriefing. It's very important to talk about what one has learned and think about how one might apply this new knowledge. Also, I'd like to give an idea of what's next. This will prompt some students to think ahead or maybe even provide something to look forward to. For example, when I tell students, be prepared for the Lego workshop, they don't always know what to think. The first semester I taught this course, one concerned student came up to me after class and said, what should I wear for a Lego workshop? And I thought, hmm, I'm sure we were probably looking at different imaginary closets. But my response was, well, wear your play clothes. As for transitioning my course, above is a list of some of the course assignments and class activities which will be used. Also, I'll run this course via Canvas course management system, and I encourage everyone to create at least one space where individuals can virtually engage and share ideas. Students will be asked to keep a daily journal, play journal, and could do this in any format they wish. I will ask for a copy at the end of the course more to see that they've been completed this task. There's absolutely no judgment on what this looks like or what's inside of it. And really, the students get extremely creative with this project, and I'm very curious to see what will this look like now that we'll be working completely in a virtual setting. Participants of this course must attend or host a play event in session and report back to the class. This was much more straightforward before COVID, and it's clear we're more limited in how we can play and with whom. But certainly many families are experiencing play in which they haven't in years. And I anticipate that most students will present their work in a synchronous fashion. However, I'll allow any type of presentation that doesn't go over five minutes. Students will be asked to create a game, but this time anything goes and they don't need a pizza box. When students left campus for spring break in March and never came back, 
of course, a few folks left their pizza boxes in their dorm rooms and they were simply paralyzed and at, at odds how on earth they might get another pizza box. We will forget that New Jersey has a pizza store every block, if not two. But still, it's that idea of there was a panic. We were all concerned. So basically, at that point, I changed the assignment and I said, anything will go. You do not need to use that pizza box. And it was really amazing to see what kind of games that the students created once the ideas opened up even further. For our visit to special collections and university archives, I'm hoping we can get a virtual show and tell of the games my college Serge Maharjan would generally show us. At least by looking at the slides and objects, we can talk about what they are, when they were made, how they got to special collections and university archives. And following Maharjan's presentations, I'll also ask students to show and tell a game that they have within their own homes or living spaces. And as well, the whole class will make cootie catchers together, which is something we do when we all meet in person. Game day is really the easiest of them all. There are many games. You can play in a virtual setting. However, this is again, one of these moments where we must be aware that not all participants will have the same access to bandwidth or additional tools or software needed. So again, make sure you know your audience and be all inclusive. The Lego workshop will likely be the biggest challenge, but honestly, I'm really not that worried. Clearly, we're not gonna use Lego. However, I could clean and send out packages of material, including Lego and other resources, which might be used throughout the course. But likely, I'll use the same prompts that I would as if I were facilitating the Lego workshop. We'll just use different materials. Although the Lego is special, it's one of many, many, many storytelling and game playing tools. And it's the process and the ideas that are evoked in a Lego workshop that make this form of play and storytelling magical. And lastly, the course will create a digital exhibit of their games, which will be added to the Rutgers Art Library Virtual Exhibition Spaces Research Guide. Each student will supply an image or video of their game, including the rules of how to play. On the last day of class, there will be a virtual reception where guests may join the class to learn more about the games they've created and what they learned in the course. And imaginary refreshments and pizza will be served. So, to recap and begin to wrapping up today, I'd like to talk a little bit about play and think about what we learned today. So we talked about play. We looked at the course I teach, as well as some ideas of how to incorporate creativity and play into your teaching. But before we conclude, let's spend a minute sharing what did you learn today? And I'd like to ask you to share anything that you learned today in the chat box. And this is casual. Anything goes. And again, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to put those in the chat box. Anyone? All right, any ideas of how you might apply what you've learned today? Yes, virtual refreshments. They are a thing. Anyone have any ideas of how you might incorporate play into your own classroom? All right. What games would work best in online teaching learning context? You know, I get asked questions about this a lot, and I think that's a really great question. What would work best in an online teaching context? And that's something to think about. What I hope you all learned, a few more ideas of how to incorporate play into your virtual classroom. You've learned a smidge more about the pedagogy of play, and a reminder, consider accessibility and inclusivity in your planning your learning sessions, workshops, and courses. But in general, I hope you leave this panel today thinking more about play and creativity, and how you might incorporate this into your work in everyday life. But on to my final thought. Whoops, there we go. Earlier in this presentation, I spoke a bit about the anxiety of play, and I'd like to share one last story. Multimedia artist Tyne Beck shared at a play conference I attended in Aarhus, Denmark. A family came to try out one of Beck's multidisciplinary projects titled Tracking You which requires wearing movement tracking cape augmented with radio frequency identification, which creates sounds. The father in the family wasn't happy, happy about wearing a silly cape, but shrugged and went along with the game anyways. Upon exiting the experience, the father was laughing and smiling. And when asked about the experience, he stated, I had so much fun, I forgot to be embarrassed. It's important to recognize that sometimes play forces you to get outside of your comfort zone. However, play can be an amazing way to communicate as well as a way in which we can learn about ourselves, others, and a dynamic and exciting way to engage with your communities. 
I'd like to thank you all for your time today and attention. And should you have questions, comments, etc., please don't hesitate to contact me. Again, this presentation is on SlideShare. I've also added citations of my work at the end of this presentation. And please let me know if you have any issues accessing. And lastly, thanks again to Roar and all the wonderful folks. And please send questions. Thank you. Megan, that was terrific. I'm jealous of the students in your classroom. I think they're going to have a blast this fall. That will be fun. Now to our second presenter, Matt Shoemaker. Matt is librarian and acts as coordinator of the Digital Scholarship Service Development at Temple University. We met Matt in June last year, where he became a key member of our Play On 2020 Research Advisory Committee. Matt inspired us by helping us to think through what it means to integrate a meaningful and effective gaming program at an academic research library. Just as he inspired us a year ago, we're sure he's going to do the same for you today. Matt runs the Loretta C. Duckworth Scholar Studio in the Charles Library at Temple. For the past decade, he's worked on building an interdisciplinary space through the library for digital scholarship and digital humanities work. He's integrated primary sources with commercial board games for history and primary source education. He's worked with faculty and students at Temple on game design, game studies, and game-based pedagogy product projects. And he continues to promote and emphasize game-based educational methodologies through the, through the Scholar Studio. His company, you have to listen carefully to this, hit him with a shoe. Get it? His last name is Shoemaker. Um, he designs game with learning outcomes objectives. We asked Matt what his favorite games were when he plays them. And he told us that his favorites were some of the heavier worker placement games by U Rosenberg, who I expect you know as the creator of the very popular games Le Havre and A Feast for Odin. Welcome, Matt, and, and to hearing more about serious play. Great. Thank you, Natalie. Get started here in just a moment. Uh, Hannah, I'm just waiting to be able to share my content. Okay, there we go. All right. All right, hopefully you can all see my slides right now and you can hear me okay. Uh, if not, someone please let me know. Um, so, as Natalie mentioned, uh, I am the head of the Laura C. Duckworth Scholar Studio. Um, and uh, we are a, a, mostly a digital humanities lab that was founded at Temple University in 2014 as a digital scholarship center. We were a small room in the basement of what was at the time the Paley Library. And uh, last year, we were lucky enough to move into our brand new Charles Library uh, with a great increase in space. It's a four-story building, and we take up about half of the third floor. Um, it's very important that we're in the library itself. Uh, this is mainly because we're a neutral space on campus. Uh, when we were being formed and uh, debated about where we should be placed, uh, it was decided that the, the library was a great spot because we were where no other uh, school or college or research department could really claim ownership over us. Um, there was no worries that uh, you have limiting access. What we see on some other labs on campus, uh, like for example, there's a great uh, makerspace in the Tyler School of Art on campus, is that they only they restrict access to only their students to be able to access them. Or at the library, we're open to everyone on campus. Um, the other thing that's great about us being in the library is that we provide access to our liaison librarians uh, that everyone can do. The subject specialists there help integrate with us and uh, work on our digital humanities, digital scholarship, and game-based learning outcomes uh, through our department. Uh, in our new space, we now feature a 16-station computer lab, which has the uh, some of the most high-tech computers available on campus. We have a high-tech computing sandbox, which contains what we wouldn't quite call a supercomputer, but something close to that, uh, as well as some interesting things of play. We have a 3D sandbox that you can play in that changes in real time um, in a digital screen that it interfaces with. We also have a virtual reality lab, which uh, is nice because it features 
space for up to 10 people to simultaneously interact with each other in their own virtual world. Uh, we also have a maker space, which consists of about 15 3D printers, two laser cutters, and several other activities, uh, electronics lab and things like that. Uh, before I continue on, something else important that I think is worth noting is that we don't uh, teach classes ourselves. We will sometimes uh, integrate with faculty in our coursework and maybe be a guest lecturer. But a lot of what we do is we work with people on individual projects. So we'll help work with people to build games or to build games for their research projects or game-based things for their courses or for their own schoolwork if they're students. Um, and we also teach a lot of workshops. So we will be running uh, courses, uh, just short little uh, non-committal things that aren't worth any credit uh, that people can attend to learn and pick up new skills. Okay. So one of the ways that we connect people through the Scholar Studio is through play and games. Uh, we work with students, faculty, and others on both video games, tabletop games, and also I want to point out virtual reality games is a slightly different thing. Um, they're closely related to video games, obviously, but there's a physical component to them, and there's a, a degree of complexity as well that works with them. That's a little different from both video games and tabletop, in my opinion. Uh, our resources on campus are used both for entertainment and research purposes. So we do allow space for people to just come in and play games for fun. Uh, this is a, a great thing for us just because it gets people to focus on the library as a space of play and learn that this is somewhere they can come to play games, whether it's for entertainment or their research purposes. And it's a safe space for them to come and do that. Um, virtual reality has been a big draw for us, um, but it can't do everything. And to this point, we find a lot more flexibility and a lower learning curve when we work with people with tabletop games. It's simply easier to jump into the design process without needing to know how to code. Um, it's easier to modify things. And a lot of times they're very accessible, especially when we have the games that people can use to modify in the library itself. Tabletop also has a tactile component similar to that, uh, which is the physicality you can find in certain VR games. Obviously, you're not moving around with tabletop as you are in virtual reality. Um, but it, it's still the tactile nature of the tabletop game adds something to it that you just kind of lacking in a traditional 2D video game. Uh, a lot of times when I work on with people on focusing with games and game-based play um, is to focus on the experience of play that they go through. And that one of the takeaways that they have through going through a game, um, kind of whether it's an emotional impact or just what they're feeling through playing the game and how that helps them uh, come to their research outcomes or their other learning goals. Uh, something else we do in the library is work with a lot of gaming clubs. There's gaming clubs on campus, both for uh, students as well as at least one for faculty. Um, right here is image are some students from the eSports Guild. Uh, they, when we were in session before COVID hit, they were coming to us weekly to run a uh, basically game tournaments that they would play through every night, um, or not every night, once a week in our spaces. Um, what a lot of this does also is it gets back to that concept of tying the library as a, place of, uh, a, a space of play. Um, and it really just makes people comfortable to come to us for games and their game needs. Working, great, uh, working with groups is also great for our outreach. Uh, this eSport group, for instance, their members will come and play in their weekly nights, but then they might come back to us for game-related assistance and resources, um, whether it's tabletop games or something they need for a course uh, or for their homework um, that they're doing with us. We also work with faculty groups, um, which lets the faculty know that we are here to assist them with their game-based needs and integrates with them in the same way that our student outreach does. Uh, to that mode, we also integrate with faculty on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, for certain game projects. This particular image you're looking at here is from a game we just worked on this past year with a faculty member from the art education department. Uh, and she was working on creating games with underprivileged middle school girls. So the game that they ended up working on for this project uh, was focused on the girls' concerns about the future of the environment. Um, so we held several uh, discussions with the girls where they worked through uh, what they thought games should be, how they played them, and then they worked with an external developer to actually create this game uh, where you go through and try to convince people with, with uh, documentation to kind of save the planet uh, and improve the quality of air and, and other things that are being polluted upon in the environment of the world. 
We also try to actually play games uh, with faculty and staff. Uh, right now, in fact, we're going through a play session uh, through the 1999 game Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri. Uh, we chose this game because we can play it over the pandemic via email. Um, it's a turn-based uh, 4X game. Um, so with that, basically everyone gets to take a turn and then they email it on to the next person and they keep going. We're playing this game because it has a lot of uh, climate change and environmental impacts within it. And it's something that we can use to think about more how we can work with more games and ways and how the commercial sector has approached the topics of climate change through games and gameplay. Uh, okay. Uh, something else we've done is we try to connect with communities, um, with external to the university environment. So for example, a couple years ago, we created the best 50 years in gaming site, which is for the 50th anniversary of the Gen Con gaming convention, which is the longest running and largest tabletop game convention in North America. Uh, it has over 70,000 people attending this on an annual basis. Um, what we did is we digitized the programs from all 50 years of the show and turned their event game listings into a searchable database for people to explore the history of games through this convention. We also conducted several oral histories of people who have attended the show at different points in its history and created a historic map and timeline of significant gaming and convention-related events during Gen Con's history. All this provided us with a resource to examine the history of play through this convention and allowed us to connect to the tabletop gamers who have attended the, game, the Gen Con game convention. It's also been good for research. We've had several external people contact us using the database in particular to uh, do studies on how Gen Con and gameplay has changed over time and how uh, the, the games themselves have uh, changed and what that can tell us about society. One other thing we like to do is focus on the physicality of games, particularly for tabletop and virtual reality experiences that people go through. Uh, we like to do this uh, not only because it really ties into these mediums, but also because it allows us to tie our makerspace into play and increase the number of skills students can learn. So now they're not only learning about games and play for their own education and research, but they're learning about how to work with making technologies as well. Um, it also adds in an extra connection point to play and experience by allowing the, the extra dimensionality and touch to their experience of play. Um, so what it does is it allows them to understand the external components of a game. For example, here on the left-hand image of the screen, you are seeing a 3D topographical map for a game that I'm currently developing that allows for the players to see why their game personas may have so much difficulty with the terrain they are encountering within the game. Having this in a physical form allows them to touch and interpret this information differently than just looking at a 3D image on a 2D screen. Uh, you really notice uh, when you're working with people in person at just how much it impacts them when they're able to touch and interact with an object rather than just kind of look at something. We also find that being able to create physical representations of game characters can help the investment in the gameplay. So for example, here, students create and 3D print miniature representations of their characters for role-playing games. This can help them better connect to the characters they are playing in the game, and having representation of each other's characters to pick up and interact with also helps the players better connect with each other uh, through play and the experiences of the characters that they are portraying. So one project that we worked on that I'm quite proud of is our integration of primary sources in tabletop games. Um, so we chose board games because they are much easier to modify than video games themselves. I mentioned earlier, there's no need to learn to code. You can just kind of take a game out of the box. You can add things, you can take things away without severely impacting things. And if you decide it doesn't work, you can easily put things back or remove them. Uh, so what we really try to do is take a game and its framework of rules and then integrate the context of primary sources to give meaning to a specific situation. This allows us to create uh, scenarios something that is pretty common in the world of war games. So in wargaming, you will have a set of rules that define what you can do within a game, but then it is usually up to the players to provide the context of this, uh, the actual operation that they're gonna perform through play. So we're just taking that concept and applying it to board games in this case. So what we did here was we took the game Settlers of America, Trails to Rails, which is a Settlers of Catan style game where players race to build a rail empire in the United States. We then took 19th century primary sources related to the railway building in the United States and pulled out different stories we could tell from those sources. Each of these stories became gameplay scenarios 
for the players and to take part of the historical actors in order to play through the scenario. This allowed us to integrate the content of the primary sources into the gameplay, and then the players were able to experience at some level what it may have been like to go through the decision-making process from a historical sense through the abstraction of play. I'm just going to go through a couple of the scenarios we developed here. This first one was based on the labor industry and labor strikes that took place in the 19th century. Uh, each player ran a railroad company that must make choices during play that impact their relations with their labor community. These labor choices could improve or hinder their ability to win the game. Being harsh on labor does not necessarily mean worse conditions for them to win, but rather a larger chance of a labor event such as a strike. The scenario also integrated some contemporary economic events to simulate the aspects of business and labor relations who are not necessarily under control of the railway industry. Mechanically speaking, uh, this changed the game in several ways. So we lengthened the game turn somewhat. So in order to add the economic events, as well as a labor phase where players were able to interact with their labor relations. Each player was in control of their labor force's reactions based on the decisions that they made. We also had to slightly modify the victory conditions of the game to ensure these impacts could be felt through what was necessary to win the game. Another scenario that we developed was called the Long Depression, which was designed to emulate the market instability that railroads uh, felt strongly during the, uh, what was known as the Long Depression of the 1870s. Ultimately, players are trying just to maintain their profits and end the game with more finances than their opponents. It uses a set of predetermined disaster events which happen in a random order to put pressure on the players and the decisions they make. And those disaster events are based on real-world events that the primary sources uh, indicated actually happened that people went through during these times. Mm -hmm. Mechanically, the scenario required us to set the game length to an 11 turns, which each of these turns representing one real-world year. We also added in the potential for players to be eliminated from gameplay should their railroad business do too poorly. This was a major departure from the main game, which does not have player elimination. We added in the seven disaster events as deployable through either randomly drawn cards or by rolling dice against the table to see which event would be triggered. We also needed to modify the game's victory conditions. Normally, you win this game by delivering all of your goods, but this scenario required the creation of a points-based victory system to accommodate for uh, how people were doing financially with their empires. And the last scenario I'm going to go over is corporate abuse. So this one was designed to simulate the first price-fixing scheme that occurred in the United States, which used coal as the commodity that was being fixed. One player begins the game as the offending business and must convince the government that its practices are actually legal, uh, which they very much were not. Um, if they succeed, they have a large leg up on the other players in the game. And if they fail, they are hindered, and the other players may be able to more easily eclipse them despite the advantage that they have. Uh, mechanically speaking, the main thing the scenario modified from the base game was the player levels. So in this game, the players are all asymmetrical. One player in particular has a large leg up on the competition. And the main takeaway from this scenario and something that we've learned through doing these games over the years is that these games don't always have to be fair. You can learn just as much from an unfair gameplay experience as you can from a fair one. You may not wish to play that particular scenario again, but the lesson is learned and it has served its purpose. Uh, one other thing we try to do is actually make and uh, publish games. So last year, I produced Be Lives, We Will Only Know Summer. It's a worker placement and resource management game um, that is all about the lives of wild honeybees. It aims to give players an emotional experience by having them live through one year in the life of a wild hive of bees. This game was designed to be attractive to both board game enthusiasts and educators who want to teach others about animal behavior. By having players experience the lives of bees through play, we hope they not only learn more about how bees behave, but also that the players will empathize with the hardship that honeybees face. This is something that I try to work into any game that we produce is really focusing on people not only having fun with the games, which is, of course, difficult because fun is subjective, but also uh, just being able to have some sort of emotional attachment and experience to the game that can help ed educate them about uh, the experience through play. All right. So before I leave you, I'm going to give you a short demonstration of a tool that I found to be very useful in the pandemic, Tabletop Simulator. Uh, this is something that I've used before COVID hit but it's become extremely useful since then, since it's one of the only ways that I found to be able to experiment with and play test tabletop games in a virtual setting. The program works on both Windows and Macintosh computers. Uh, it typically costs $20 via the Steam platform, but it's very common to find it on sale for $10 instead. 
You can have up to 10 players per game. And it, the most important thing about this is that it allows the, cre the creation of custom content. Uh, many, many people have taken advantage of this. There's more than 17,000 board games available to download, for most of them for free. Some of them you have to pay for on Steam that are usable in this platform. And of course, you can also just create your content so it's local as well, which is what I usually do. So you don't have to share the games you're working on. You can just use them on your own platform. Uh, so with that, let me see here if I can get this up. All right, so hopefully you can all see Tabletop Simulator here. I'm just going to jump into the server quick. Okay, great. All right, so what you do is you create a table uh, and then I'm going to just load this game up. All right, so what we're seeing here is a game that's currently titled Algeria 1857. This is a game that we are working on. Uh, it deals with the colonial conquest of Algeria. Um, specifically, it's dealing with the Kabyle people uh, in northern Algeria and who were the last to be conquered by the French. And it's kind of a futile uh, game in some ways because you can't really win. The best you can do is hold out from the French longer. Um, this is a, our attempt at a feminist war game. Uh, we brought in, back in all the people that are usually stripped out of war games, women, children, the elderly, and put them back into this game, really kind of show and uh, focus on the players that interact with this. So in Tabletop Simulator, we have many decks of cards here. You can shuffle these as you need to. Um, they're set up for each player, which is set up on the sides of the boards here. I can deal cards into my hand, um, which you can see here. If you have problems reading them, you can, of course, magnify these. You can get a better view of everything. Um, what this, this platform really is, is a physics engine for tabletop. So you can pick up and manipulate pieces, move them around however you need to. Uh, the game doesn't really care what you, what you do with it. Um, it just lets you kind of play around on a table like it was a real world table. Uh, you can roll multiple dice uh, to get their outcomes. You can deal cards to players. Uh, and you can interact with them in many other ways. I'm going to load up one other game here quick just to show one other feature that I like about this program. And that is that it has some scripting elements that you can interact with if you wish. You notice over here, this is for a, a card game that I'm working on. Um, there's a two player and a four player button. So what I did was write up some simple script in the Lua language to uh, quickly uh, set the game up for play. So I'm going to do a two player game. I can just push this button. And it will immediately lay out all the cards that I need to play with this game. This is something that you can use to help set up and get things going. Something else nice about this platform is that you can also use it for dexterity games. Uh, so you're not just set up to doing cards and dice. You've got something where you need to flick pieces. You can move them around uh, and bounce them around all over the place. And just do what you need if you're playing a game like Catacombs, uh, which I believe is on a system or something else. Uh, and that is my presentation for today. So I will leave you with that impression of Tabletop Simulator. Uh, thank you for listening. That was true. That was really true. Oops, sorry, trying to stop. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to Megan to unmute. Move into the answer. Um, I've been fielding a number of questions to try and alternate between the two. So, a question for Megan to start: How can you encourage shy introverts or introverts to engage in gaming? And do you notice any difference between um, the take up of students of a different um, year, let's say first year students versus seniors? Could you repeat the third, like the third word, like just repeat the first four or five words you went out. Oh. But what I think I heard you say was asking a question about how to encourage maybe shy, quiet, undergraduates, graduates. Okay, cool. Great question. Um, I think that one of the things um, I have to really think about is really who is that audience that I'm dealing with? And I spent a lot of time thinking about that. I'm fortunate with this particular play class that I know that these are all first freshmen, first semester to campus. They couldn't be any greener. They couldn't be wound any more tight. Um, so this is a surprisingly enough, this is a class that can be a little anxious for them. 
Um, I really slow roll them into this. I see that someone asked about the Lego workshop. And one of the things that we do particularly with the Lego workshop is you start on an activity where you're working solo. The second activity, well, you're working with someone else. The third activity, you're engaging again in a group in a different way. And then by the fourth activity, you're all together as a group, everyone's screaming and laughing and you forgot you didn't even know each other. So that's one way to really massage folks into it. Don't just throw someone into a game and something complicated that they've never known before. That's the first way to turn people off. Um, but I will say this semester, it was wild. I had um, my class, there was some confusion with it getting posted. We ended up with uh, eight people in it at the very last second who registered over five days. They were all very quiet. It took me two classes to get these folks warmed up. In fact, I wasn't even sure I was, but I just had to really work at it. And I, I spent a lot of time listening to their needs and wants. One thing librarians are not good about, we read, we read, we look at theory, and then we assume and apply what we read. Talk to your people. That's how you get success and impact. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And here's a question for Matt. Um, what's the biggest takeaway from students that are participating in your makerspace, do you think? Uh, the biggest takeaway I have is just how quickly that they uh, kind of grab onto these technologies and really want to work with and get enthused by them. Um, so the students really work within the makerspace um, to uh, kind of create something and imagine it. Now, a lot of these students that we're working with aren't necessarily in art or engineering fields. They could be in any discipline. A lot of them are from the humanities, people who aren't necessarily working with these technologies usually, and they're just amazed by what they can actually build and, and use with them. And the thing that always strikes me as impressive is just how much them working with something physical really kind of impacts and, and it seems to interact with their brain in like a different way. Um, by really working with and playing with these kind of physical uh, tools and these physical materials that they're creating, uh, it, it really just kind of stimulates them in different ways than that I see when I work with people in different contexts. Yeah, that's great. And let's go back to Megan. Megan, um, you were talking about the excitement and the fun you bring to classes. How do you strike a balance between fun and more focused learning objectives or what we're calling here serious play? Absolutely, that's one of the biggest questions that um, I get asked. And I think that um, certainly my, my work all with play really started with the Lego. And I cannot tell you how many naysayers, how many <laughs> negative comments, how many really unfortunate things colleagues said that didn't understand what I was doing. But anyone that knows me is that I'm a strong force. If you think no, well, you better watch out because you're going to get it tenfold. So I really just plowed through and thinking a lot about how do you engage with this kind of stuff? And I'm sorry, say repeat the question to me one more time. How do you balance fun with balance, yes. what I'm calling more focused learning objectives? Scholarly. Sure, absolutely. So one of the things you have to overlook those naysayers because that's the first thing of that understanding of thinking that this isn't scholarly, but you know, Matt made a really great statement. When you start working together with these hands-on engagement and learning, it's not like lecture to in front of people. You actually stop, you think, you learn about others. So this is a really, really important engagement. And unfortunately, I think it's something that many, many faculty and people who are teaching in higher education aren't thinking about. And they're thinking more of this asynchronous way. And we really need to think about how to engage this. And I think that Matt also touched on this a little bit, but one of the things that's really powerful about this and one way to share this in that scholarly look is that, you know, we're making something together in a time where everything is virtual. So yeah. that's powerful within its own self. But I also think that you have to think about what's involved in this. When Matt's, you know, Matt's group is this great example. I could write now 10 things of scholarly ways that Matt's gaming is using or this class and this ID. Literacy, you're learning information literacy skills, creative thinking, online thinking, virtual thinking, how to engage with others. I could go on and on. We teach copyright. We teach open access. You name it. And I'm going to tell you right now, students are learning from gaming about these things. No one goes into a workshop and says, oh my gosh, I can't wait to hear about open access. I can't wait to hear about information literacy. This is how you have to engage. If you really want people to hear and learn what your message is, this is a really powerful tool. Yeah, and you, you mentioned it at the beginning of your talk too, that with play, 
failure doesn't really exist. It's just a part of the learning experience, which is wonderful. You know, it's refreshing. I'm sorry, I work with freshmen and they come in to be doctors. These are honor students. They are not programmed to fail. They need a dose of failure. Then they can really start to engage and learn. That's terrific. Matt, we're getting questions. We're, we're intrigued with your makerspace. But then the question is, how do you engage students if they're not going to have the ability, this term, let's say, to have access to that space? And one, one answer is tabletop simulator which was terrific. Thanks for the demonstration. What are some of your other strategies if, if it's going to be a time of physical distancing? Yeah, so something else we're doing is, is engaging with a lot of these technologies through their kind of digital counterparts. So when you're working with and creating 3D models, for instance, you need to still work in a three-dimensional space. You still, on a computer, I mean. So you still need to download programs and work with these to help design these elements, to interact with them. And there's a lot of people that have kind of acknowledged this in some ways, which is why we've ended up with programs like Tabletop Simulator. So you can work uh, with things like Tinkercad, uh, with Mudbox, with uh, other programs that people need to work with in these uh, makerspace environments to help kind of interact uh, with, the, with the students and kind of help them work in still 3D in a 2D environment. I, I don't like it as much, obviously, as doing things in person, and they don't get the outcome, but what we've seen so far is that then they're more excited to come into the makerspace when we are open again, uh, which for us is very soon. We're actually opening back up again on Monday, which is a little scary. Uh, but we'll see how that goes. Um, but there, we've, we've already got some people that signed up to come back into the makerspace to help build some of the things they've been making over the summer. Um, so part of it is just kind of getting them excited about uh, and working and interacting with them on the components that they can do at home alone, um, and then just get them ready to come in and work on it in person when we're open up again. Matt, you're sharing some wonderful resources with us, and we're getting questions. People want the PowerPoints. They want to, you know, get the names of the resources. Maybe you could follow up with an email. You caught mud box, but just with some of the things that people might like to know about and use. Yeah, sure. That would be great. And so one last question, Megan. There are a couple of people who are asking, what's your maximum class size typically for this kind of game-based? So, um, for this particular course that I teach, the Plane to Learn in Higher Education, it's capped at 18. But okay. I do want to say when I do, I do a lot of Lego workshops um, across campuses and a lot with uh, administration, higher administration, and really getting people in roles that don't play to play. And the max number I think we've ever done on a Lego workshop and play session is about 120. Um, wow. We don't generally go that big, but um, it works. You just have to really look at who your people are and think about what you're doing right. and what and you're trying to answer. Last question for Matt. Um, somebody who's, who's used Tabletop Simulator is asking, do students have to buy their own licenses? Uh, unfortunately, they do generally. I mean, we do have some licenses for it within the libraries that they can use if they're on site, but that just the way the licensing works, they can't use that at home. Um, so that is something they would need to acquire. Uh, luckily, the price isn't too bad. I mean, we look at it as something, you know, it's better than most textbooks for sure, um, but they'll hopefully get use out of it. But that, that is the one downside to it. But I have seen no open source or other free type of alternatives that work for anything close to this to doing any, for recreating the, the tabletop feel in a virtual space. Yeah, I took notes. <laughs> Thank you very much, you two. This was a fabulous um, presentation, and the follow-up questions that we're getting suggest that people want to revisit the presentation and actually think through some of the, the tips and ideas you had. So just to let everybody know, we send a recording of our presentations, and we will um, you'll be able to see the, the PowerPoints there. We'll also send a list of the resources once I hear back from, from Matt and Megan, and we'll be able to share that with you. So first, thanks to both of you, really amazing presentations. Thanks for doing this in virtual space and showing just how engaging that could be. Um, I have three other thank yous and then a game to tell you about. Um, the first thank you is to our, our team. So there are a lot of people behind the scenes that make this happen. So today's team is Hannah Deskin, Michelle McLeod, Julien Couture, Thomas Dordlin, and Jennifer Garland. Thanks everybody. To the Social Sciences and Research Council of Canada, 
who provided funding for the series, and also private sponsors, Ron Harvey and Doug Bagley, for making the series possible. Third thank you is to everybody for coming. We look forward to seeing you at our next event, which will be on August the 25th, also at three o'clock. And that's going to be called More Than a Game, The Changing Roles of Game Librarians and Game Collections in Academic Libraries. And that will be with Michelle Goodridge. And then I told you I'd speak about a game. Um, the library has developed um, a digital game as an orientation experience. It's a discovery game that we're going to release in time for Frosh activities in August. And so we'll send you a, a short poster about it, but stay tuned because we'll be releasing that probably around August the 25th. And so we're looking forward to being able to share the library with you and some of our treasures and the treasures of McGill history in a digital environment. So thanks everybody. Until next time, stay well.